All right, the recording has begun. Uh, and if any of you were disconnected while we um, started, please feel free to, you know, I hope they they connect back to the class. So we were at Acts chapter 18. And uh, uh, we'll require one of us to read through this passage. Uh, and then, you know, I'll begin to explain it for us. Uh, can somebody read? from verse 1 to verse 4, please. Let's start there, and then we'll go further. Acts 18, verses 1 through 4. Can I read, Pastor? Yes, Ash, please go ahead. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Sapphira, a native of Pontus, recently came, come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome, and he went to see them. Yes, thank you for that, uh, Asha. So uh, here, you know, we have the direction in which the journey went. So from Athens to Corinth is where Paul came. And over here, he meets two new people. So there is Aquila and Priscilla, what do we know about these two people? They are a couple. And uh, Aquila is the man. Priscilla is the lady. They are, um, uh, you know, tent makers by profession. And we also know that according to the history, uh, that Claudius in AD 49, Roman Emperor Claudius, uh, he had an edict issued uh, in which he had asked the Jews to leave Rome uh, for a, a certain period of time. So he ordered them to leave Rome, and which is why these two have come to the city of Corinth. And they continue with their profession of tent making. And Paul meets them over here. Okay, uh, But we will notice you know, later there's another mention of the same couple, but uh, in the context of them teaching the scriptures. So our understanding is that Paul met with them. Now, whether or not they were believers when they first met Paul, um, they definitely gave their life to the Lord and they grew in God to an extent where they both were teachers of the word. So. Uh, they became believers and they also became co-workers with Paul. So that is uh, some understanding regarding uh, these two individuals. And uh, the way Paul would go and minister to people in the synagogues, he takes the same approach. So in verse 4, he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. So he's continuing his with his work of uh, preaching the gospel. So from verse 5, um, let us read all the way till verse 17, please. So if one of us can read it, then I can uh, come back and explain. Verse 5 to 17, Acts 18. Can you read that? Uh, yes, Asha. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the work, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles and be. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Uh, should I continue, Pastor? Um, Chris, yes, Asha. Chris, Chris, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will snatch you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. Uh, please go on till 17, 1, 7. And he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. But when Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul 
and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when people was a when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or victorious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of question about words and names and your own law, and say to and say to yourself, I refuse to be a judge of these things, and we drove them from the tribunal, and they were they all seized sustained the ruler of the synagogue and hit him in front of the traveling, but Galileo paid no attention to any of this. Yes, uh, thank you for uh, reading through uh, what transpired in the city of Corinth. Now, like Athens, we have to understand that Corinth was also um, a well-known city. It was a port city uh, and it was also a booming commercial center. So it is a very important city, uh, you know, in the region uh, at the time. Uh, and it was known as the ornament of Greece. So it was that popular thanks to uh, you know trade and all that uh, was taking place there and uh, even at that point uh, it is said that there were at least 200000 people who lived in this large city uh, the city when uh, you have studied about um, or maybe right now you're doing the book of corinthians you understand that the city uh, was dedicated to a goddess uh, known as aphrodite uh, and uh, this goddess, you know, the, the popularity of this goddess is that she was a goddess of love uh, and, um, uh, you know, she uh, had temple prostitutes. So there were uh, male and female uh, prostitutes who were assigned to the temple. And you know, this this was the important thing about God in the temple of the goddess Afro Fry, Afro uh, Aphrodite and, um, you know, all these practices. So uh, the reputation, the reputation of Corinth was uh, one of immorality. That's that's how, while it was known for its trade and all the commercial uh, uh, things that were going on, uh, there was also immorality in the city. And um, uh, the city was known for pleasure. OK, so notice how every city has a background and therefore the people also uh, will will have a certain certain lifestyle and, uh, uh, you know, exposure. And uh, as a minister of God, Paul has to uh, deal with you know, what what the people are coming with. So earlier it was a very intellectual city, Athens, and uh, he ministered uh, in context, but he never compromised the word of God, neither did he compromise, you know, the power of God. Now, coming to Corinth, we will see that, you know, Paul will start his ministry. He meets with these people known as Aquila and Priscilla initially, and then, you know, he goes to the synagogue, starts preaching over there, and there is a, a you know a, an okay uh, response but uh, eventually he notices that the jews are not open to the gospel so uh, he's quite angry okay? he's quite angry and he decides that he is now going to preach to the gentiles so that's what he states there in verse 6 um, but when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, your blood be upon your own hands. I am clean from now on. I will go to the Gentiles. So he makes a decision and starts ministering to the Gentiles. So then there are names of uh, Gentiles that we can read here. Justice, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. You know, um, he goes there and he begins to minister. Then Crispus, Crispus is a ruler. So these are all people about whom we have a little, uh, like a short description, uh, but we know that they were definitely not the so-called high class people who uh, Paul went to first and tried sharing the gospel. So when they were not listening, he just went to the Gentiles. He just went to, you know, those whose hearts were open. So Crispus, uh, a ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household. And many of the Corinthians hearing, believed and were baptized. So many of the Corinthians, again, you know, there could be uh, so many names there that, you know, we really don't know. And 
Corinthians, you know, as we say Corinthians, it's understood that these were all people who came from uh, an exposure to a life of pleasure, uh, sinfulness, immorality. So in the book of Corinthians, Paul will address you know, these matters um, when they when they become disciples. You know, he'll talk to them about living a morally pure life uh, and uh, you know a life which is holy unto the lord and uh, getting rid of our you know ungodly practices so he will address these matters to these corinthians who have now become his congregation who have now become the believers so uh, verse 9 you know, very beautiful and this is how god works we are seeing again and again how god is speaking to his ministers he's guiding them in this passage, there is an encouragement which God gives to Paul. And verse 9, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak and do not be silent. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. So you know, God had a purpose and God had a plan. He uh, wanted Paul to go on and, uh, uh, you know, make disciples, strengthen them in the word of God. However, uh, it's possible that Paul probably got discouraged, you know, and uh, that is why God had to give him a word of encouragement to say that, you know, uh, keep moving on and do the work that you know i've called you to do uh, and uh, that is why you know there there is that uh, vision that he gets and god says i'm with you okay i'm with you we see that even in the old testament many times to encourage god says i am with you and uh, paul continues with the strength of god and he ministers for one year and six months teaching the word of god among the people so after that you know there is again a stirring up uh, against paul and here we have an individual known as gallio who is the proconsul of achaia uh, there are different people who are in authority and we've seen how god has rescued his own people earlier in philippi you know the, when the magistrates uh, put paul in a uh, put Paul and Silas in the inner prisons, how God rescued them you know, through that earthquake. So God has a way of rescuing his people. Here in, in uh, Corinth, people approach the proconsul, Gallio, and they bring a complaint against Paul. Now, thankfully, you know, just the way Gamaliel had an opinion, uh, at, we saw that early on in Acts, Gallio, uh, he assesses the situation in a very unique way. So he lets the people know in verse 14, he tells them, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. So basically he's saying, if Paul is a person who uh, is doing evil things, I can take charge. I can punish him. but." Verse 15, but if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be a judge of such matters. So uh, Galio, Galio understands that the, the quarrel between the Jews and Paul is more about beliefs. And so you know, he says, this is not a, 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 a matter for the courts to decide. This is not a legal matter at all. You know, this, this is something else. This is philosophical. So he says, please deal with it yourselves and don't bring it to me because I'm not going to uh, uh, judge this situation. So obviously, the people got very angry in verse 16. Uh, and he drove them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sostenus, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Gallio took no notice of these things. So they got angry. And over here, more specifically, the Greeks got very angry, it says. And uh, we are told that to get the attention of the proconsul, they engaged in this, um, uh, you know, this. Uh, 
engaged in the beating up of uh, an individual called as Sosthenes. And uh, Sosthenes was probably a believer also. Um, uh, and this did not obviously uh, you know, get Gallio back on the matter. So this is what transpired in Corinth. Okay, So the highlight that we can take back is that many were saved and a church was uh, established in the city of Corinth. Uh, we also understand that the background of this, these people was such that you know Paul had to ensure that they were well equipped in the word of God so that they could live out uh, a righteous life before the Lord. So he stayed on, of course, with God's encouragement because it was not easy. There was opposition in every city where Paul went. And even in Corinth, you know, people were rising up, um, especially the Jews were rising up against him. But thank God, you know, God made a way for uh, Paul to escape. Now, moving on to the next part here. Uh, I will read it or, or maybe somebody else can read it. It's always better. Uh, verses 18 through 23, the remaining of uh, Paul's a second missionary journey. Uh, can someone read it for us, please? Acts 18, verse 18 through verse 23. Okay, I will read. Yes, Mangi. Please go ahead. Uh, verse 18. So Paul still remained a good, a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Sincrea, for he had taken a vow, and he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with Jews. When they asked him to stay at a, uh, a longer time with, it, with them, he did not consent but took leave of them saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at uh, Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time, uh, time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galicia and uh, that name is difficult to read in order to strengthen all the disciples. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Mangi. Um, so, you know, we are looking at uh, Paul's journey, which continues. He moves from Corinth, he comes to Ephesus. Okay. Uh, but he brings along with him um, brethren, it says. So usually when they use the word brethren, it's understood that um, they are now believers. Because remember when Ananias went to Saul uh, and God gave him, you know, the, God spoke to Ananias. He meets Saul, but he's convinced that he's now a believer. So he says, brother Saul. Uh, and then, you know, he ministers to uh, to him. So brethren is a, a terminology which helps us understand that they, they were believers. So he took leave of the brethren. He uh, sailed for Syria. Syria is back to Antioch. So he's trying to complete his uh, mission trip. Uh, and he took with him Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, and it says that he had his hair cut off at Sencria for he had taken a vow. Okay, now people ask the question, why, what is the need for a vow? Um, Jesus said, let your yes be yes, let your no be no. But you see, vow is more of something that uh, one, one, you, the Jews used to practice this. You know, they, they would make vows with the Lord. So it was more like a commitment which they would keep unto the Lord. And it was also something that had to do with consecration or dedication. So they would practice it for their lives to remain holy. Okay. So for whatever reason, Paul is practicing uh, some of the Jewish things. Like, you know, we saw how the uh, um, apostles, they went to the, the temple. They went during the, the times of prayer 
which were appointed for the Jews. And in the same way, another practice that Paul seems to follow is uh, the making of vows. So why did he make a vow? There can be many reasons. Some commentators say that when he ministered in Corinth, um, he really needed to experience um, closeness with God. And he really needed to reaffirm to himself that you know he is consecrated unto the Lord. So um, which is why he made a vow to God. And he said that, you know, I will have my hair cut off when I finish this assignment and I go to uh, Sankria. So he took it upon himself uh, to spend that phase of his life uh, in, in a very dedicated way unto the Lord. So it was his own personal um, you know, conviction to, to have his hair cut off and uh, keep this vow unto the Lord. And some commentators also say that he had to um, doubly keep himself dedicated to the Lord because Corinth was a very sinful place so uh, you know it it was a way that he put constraints on himself to to uh, be careful and to live a holy life for god in a sinful city so these are all explanations for why uh, he he probably made a vow but he did make a vow to god so when he went to sankria you know, he had his hair cut off there. Uh, and then he comes to Asia. Remember, we talked about Asia Minor, present day Turkey. So Ephesus is a place that's a very, very important place. We will see that the next missionary journey of Paul, the third missionary journey, is a, a time when he will spend a lot of time. He will spend up to three years in Ephesus, where the, he will he will run something like a Bible college and uh, you know raise up many, many uh, disciples for the Lord. But during the second missionary journey, it's just a touch and go. So he comes to Ephesus. And uh, he leaves Aquila and Priscilla there. He left them there, it says. But he himself entered the synagogue in, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, this doesn't mean he he uh, uh, left them in Ephesus. But later on, you know, we will notice that Aquila and Priscilla were left behind in Ephesus. But, you know, Paul actually moves on. Uh, he does a little bit of ministry during the second missionary journey in the synagogue. Then, um, yeah, he moves out of there, goes to Caesarea, uh, and then completes his uh, journey by going to Antioch of Syria. Uh, and after that, verse 23, you know, it talks about his next journey, uh, where he says, after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. So we will notice that this third missionary journey, which is starting off from verse 23, we have uh, Luke is telling us the third missionary journey has started, that it will be more about strengthening the existing churches. So we may not read of new cities where Paul went and uh, planted a new church, but it will be more about going to the same places and you know causing the churches to be strengthened so the region of Gal galatia what is that i told us you know we we are we are familiar with the first missionary journey where iconium lystra derby those are all part of the region of Gal galatia okay and phrygia and so he's going on and strengthening the disciples there now coming to the last portion of acts chapter 18 here we read about um, Aquila and Priscilla. So Paul traveled out of Ephesus, but two people remained in Ephesus, which would be Aquila and Priscilla. So let's do this. Let's read um, from 24 to 28. And I will request uh, any one of us to actually do the reading. Yeah. Shall we read? Yes, brother. Yes. Yeah. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria. And an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped 
those who have believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is Christ. Yes, uh, thank you, Brother Manoha, for reading that. So now uh, we we are not talking about Paul anymore. So Paul has completed his missionary journey. He's starting a second missionary journey. He's starting his third missionary journey. But this is um, this is a scene from Ephesus where he left behind Aquila and Priscilla. So what is happening? There is uh, a Jew by the name of Apollos who comes to Ephesus. The origin of Apollos, he's from Alexandria. OK, uh, now what is special about Apollos? He's a Jew, one. Second is we are told that he was an eloquent man, meaning he was a good speaker. Uh, we third thing is he was mighty in the scriptures. So he is obviously a godly person who has studied the scriptures very well. And he is from Alexandria. One thing that Aquila and Priscilla noticed about Apollos is, yes, he's so good uh, with his knowledge. But he is missing the present truth. So what do we mean by that? No, the, the word of God says, verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he is stuck only at the baptism of John. So he's probably never heard that, you know, there is something known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So is he, a, he, is he um, you know, a person who is, who is holding on to wrong teaching? No, his doctrine is very accurate. That's what we've known. But what is the problem with, you know, this believer, if we could say so? He's still stuck at a level of truth, okay, which is not current to the times when he was living. So he did not know, nobody ever taught him about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So that was not his fault. So when, you know, Aquila and Priscilla uh, realized that, hey, this guy, he is so um, eloquent and, you know, he speaks boldly in the synagogues about, uh, uh, about Jesus, they felt that they must update him on what God is doing you know, in their times. So they take him aside. Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So basically updating the uh, doctrine which Apollos carried. So he would have been taught about many other things that they probably learned from Paul. Okay, which Apollos did not know. So now Apollos is equipped. He is updated. And what happens? We are told from verse 27 that he desired to cross to Achaia. So he comes from Alexandria to Ephesus, which is in Asia. Now he goes to Greece, okay, the Achaian region. He goes to Greece, which place is in Achaia, Corinth. So he goes to Corinth, okay, uh, and uh, yeah, he wants to serve there in Corinth. So you know, he goes up there. So I'll just read from verse 20, 27. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. So he did some excellent ministry in Corinth. Now, there are other things that also happen. You know, we read about um, uh, Paul, uh, read about Paul's uh, rebuke to the Corinthians, where he says that uh, don't be followers of Apollo, so don't be followers of me. So basically, it's possible that after Paul left, you know, there was some division among the congregation, where you know people were siding Apollos, and some were you know um, followers of Apollos, and some others were followers of Paul. But then you know, he says, uh, "Don't do that. We are all followers of Christ, and we need to follow Jesus Christ." So uh, our understanding is that in Corinth, initially we had people like Paul, Aquila, Priscilla lay a very good foundation for the believers. Uh, but later, 
there's another person who is sent there because he desired to go there by the name of Apollos, and he also continued a good work in um, Corinth. Okay, so there are so many names uh, that we are not reading in acts of believers and leaders, but when we read the epistles, you will read of other names, and there you will figure out, you know, these were the people who were probably um, raised up in these particular cities. Okay, so let's now move on. We are now at Acts chapter 19, uh, which refers to the third missionary journey of Paul. Okay. So a little bit about uh, Ephesus. Ephesus is also uh, a very prominent city. But this city at that time was in Asia Minor. Okay, Ephesus in Asia Minor, whereas all the other cities, you know, we saw that they were in uh, uh, Macedonian and the Achaean regions. Uh, so the population of this city as well was somewhere around, you know, 225,000 people. Uh, and speciality of the city you know again worship they worshiped uh, a goddess known as diana and uh, the temple of diana was very prominent and a lot of people would come to to see this temple and worship at this temple and the ephesians believed in this goddess and it um, you know she was she was a uh, very popular very popular and probably the one of the primary reasons why uh, tourists would come to the city of Ephesus. And there were a lot of um, like occult practices that uh, the people of Ephesus were also engaged in. Um, so a little bit of background about Ephesus. Let's begin to read, excuse me, from Acts chapter 19. OK, uh, let's read from verse 1 to verse 10. So could somebody help us? reading these 10 verses verses 1 to 10 while Apollos was in Corinth Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed he asked them no they replied we haven't heard that there is a Holy Spirit then what baptism did you experience he asked and they replied the baptism of John Paul said, John's baptism called for re repentance from sin, but John himself told the people to believe in the one who would come later, meaning Jesus. As soon as they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in other tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Then Paul went to synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some believers became stubborn, rejecting his message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions at the lecture hall of uh, Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greek, heard the word of the Lord. Okay. Uh, yes, thank you, um, Kum. So, you know, we notice here that uh, Apollos, so simultaneously, okay, Apollos is now in Corinth. So you have a leader there who's continuing the work, but Paul passing through the upper regions, upper, upper regions, you know, the region of uh, Galat Galatia and Phrygia, we understand that. Uh, he came directly to Ephesus. On the way out of his second missionary journey, it was a rush through Ephesus. So he just stayed there for a little bit of time preaching at the synagogue. But this time around, he comes directly to Ephesus to stay there and to actually work uh, there for a longer period of time. So in his third missionary journey, you know, his third missionary journey is from AD 53 to AD 58. Okay. Uh, so he stays for, uh, you know, something like three to four years in um, the region of Ephesus. But initially, when he comes here, he notices that the people, just like Apollos, we said that, 
he was not uh, updated with the current truth. So similarly, the people of Ephesus also uh, did not know. The believers of Ephesus did not know about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So we saw that discussion. He asks them, uh, you, you know, whose baptism do you do you believe? Uh, oh, first he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? You know, this particular section, uh, it reminds us that one can be a believer because what is he saying? He's saying, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And the be obviously he's talking to people who already believe. But why is he asking the question, did you receive the Holy Spirit? Isn't it uh, uh, you know, understood that the new birth of a believer, you know, the regeneration, as the, the word of God puts it, happens only by the uh, also by the work of the Holy Spirit. So without the Holy Spirit, one cannot be born again. Okay. So the question doesn't make sense if we only think about you know being born again as the context so he's saying did you receive the holy spirit when you believe so what paul is saying is he's not talking about being born again because that work of the holy spirit they've already experienced so they've received the holy spirit in that manner then what is the second receive the holy spirit he's talking about a separate a uh, phenomenon or a separate um, uh, experience known as the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So these are two different things. If it were not so, this question would not make any sense because when one believes there is the work of the Holy Spirit, there is the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Uh, but of but we recognize you know it's about the baptism because as we continue uh, we we realize that these believers had only heard about the baptism of john so um was three when he questions he says into what baptism then were you baptized they say into john's baptism so then he prays for them uh, verse 6, when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So, can people be believers without being baptized in the Holy Spirit, without knowing about the baptism in the Holy Spirit? It is possible. And which is why Paul asks the question and leads them into this next experience, which is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Then, what else happens? You know, he takes time in Ephesus and he begins to speak boldly. It says over here for three months. Okay, uh, and reasoning, reasoning is thoroughly, very thoroughly, bringing up uh, topics which will you know help overcome their doubts. So in detail, he's presenting the gospel to these Ephesian people. In verse nine, but when some were hardened and did not believe. But spoke evil of the way before the multitude. He departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. Okay, so notice here that synagogue was the initial place where he started the ministry. But it was not very, um, you know, uh, they were not very open. So uh, eventually he went to a school. It's a school of Tyrannus. He continued there for two years and the verse itself tells us so that all who dwell in dwelt in asia heard the word of the lord jesus both jews and greeks so it worked for his advantage uh, though the people did not believe him the jews in the synagogue he came to um, the school of tyrannus Okay, and in the school of Tyrannus, we are told that there were many people who he could minister to. Uh, we will also, you know, probably look at some of the names of these people uh, a little later on. Uh, people from the regions that we have talked of so far. You know, we said uh, there is the region of Galatia. There's the region uh, of, uh, you know, Asia. Uh, we will also notice that the Colossian, 
Colossian. There are three cities over there when we talk about Colossae, we talk about um, uh, Laodicea, Herapolis. So the Colossian region, people from all these regions would have come to the school of Tyrannus and it was probably easier you know, for them to come and receive the word of God in this place called as Ephesus. And uh, God worked it out for Paul that he was able to, you know, that's why I said earlier, like, you know, like a Bible college. So he had the opportunity to run a, a school for many people in the region for up to two years. And that impacted the lives of uh, people for the glory of God. Okay, so let's go ahead. We, we will look at a few more verses before we close for today from verse 11 through verse 14. Uh, can Pastor, somebody read it? Uh, yeah, yes. Probably, probably uh, by this time, when uh, Paul came third time to Ephesus in his mm, third missionary journey, mm, uh, Aquila and Priscilla had already left from Ephesus to Rome. Mm, mm, mm. Because we don't read about them when he comes uh, third time there. So sort of, okay, on his okay. third missionary journey. Okay. Mm, so uh, that will be an assumption, uh, Brother Manohar. My suggestion is let's hold on. Let's complete the third missionary journey and we'll, we'll have a better idea. Is that okay? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, Kennedy has a question. Your blood is on your own head. What is the implication? Was he cursing them or instilling fear? Your blood is on your own head. Uh, personally, to me, it does sound like a curse. OK, so you know the way Jesus said, like, if they don't go to a city and if they don't receive you, that's the uh you know dust your feet uh so it's something like that where uh it it's coming out of his frustration that he's saying okay you don't want to listen to the truth of uh god your blood is on your own head yeah anything more kennedy All right, so I think we've uh, clarified that. OK, let's do one thing. Let's just pause. Yeah, and uh, a couple of minutes, maybe we can have some discussion instead of introducing new things right now. So the third missionary journey has begun. And um, we will study in detail about the third missionary journey uh, in the next class. But based on what we have picked up so far, any any comments, any thoughts? Uh, yes, Sri Kumar. Pastor. Uh, thank you, Pastor. I, I just want to know uh, one thing that uh, even though the Apollos and other disciples were preaching, but how they were um, unaware about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like um, they they have heard about Jesus and they were knowing that Jesus is uh, the Savior. Mm -hmm. But how? Wh what was the reason that they were unaware about uh, I just want to know because that was a common thing which we are seeing in both the places. So just yeah, sure, sure, Shri Kumar. Um, so from what I picked up, verse 25 of Acts 18, it says about Apollos, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So my understanding is he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. So many uh, well-meaning believers, based on what we are taught, you know, we we limit our understanding of God to just that. Okay. So I think Sri Kumar, it's because of his teaching. He he was probably never taught. And one more reason could be that, see, today we have the canon of scripture. We have the Bible in our hands so we can explore. But in those days, they did not have, uh, you know, the uh, particularly about 
the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which uh, happened just about you know three uh, thirty three A.D. So uh, we are we are just talking two decades from then. Uh, so maybe Apollos and the people who taught him God's word had missed out on this current truth of their times. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Yeah, sure, no problem. So uh, you know, even today we can come across good believers who may not know right about the baptism in the holy spirit or some other uh, truth from god's word so instead of putting them down it'll be nice to do what aquila and priscilla did or paul did they just took this uh, eloquent man of god aside and said okay come let's tell you what you are missing from the truth of god's word so they equipped him and updated him. Similarly, Paul, he asked people, have you received the Holy Spirit? They said, we've never even heard of such a thing as uh, the Holy Spirit. So then he says, okay, come, you know, let me tell you, let me also pray for you. And they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Yes. So any other thoughts before we close? Yes, Shri Kumar, you wanted to say something? No, no, I just want to say thank you. Okay, no problem. Thank you. All right, so let's pray and close uh, for today. Uh, Kung, will you lead us in prayer? Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for uh, this um, session that we had. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you would help us to, um, God, uh, receive a uh, and apply whatever you, uh, whatever we, uh, we've been taught, God. Um, we thank you, Lord, that uh, we continue, God, to uh, teach us and uh, God to uh, have your word in our heart that um, in everything we do, God, that we will honor you, Jesus. Thank you for um, uh, helping us uh, and for this class. God. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. God bless you. Have a wonderful weekend. Uh, see you in the next class.